Hello and welcome to National Invasive Species Awareness Week, powered by the North American Invasive Species Management Association. My name is Elizabeth Brown, and I am your Legislative Affairs Professional Development and Certified Weed-Free Products Program Manager. I'm delighted to have you with us today for the second webinar in the 2021 NISA series titled U.S. Federal Agency Updates. NISA is an international event to raise awareness about invasive species, the threat they pose, and what can be done to prevent their spread. Representatives from local, state, federal, and regional organizations gather with non-governmental organizations and private industry to discuss legislation, policies, and improvements that can be made to prevent and manage invasive species. We have an outstanding lineup of virtual webinars for you every day this week and a downloadable tool key resource toolkit, uh, turnkey resource toolkit, uh, is available on our website at nisa.org for your use. Before we begin today's webinar, let me take a quick moment to share a little bit about NASMA with you uh, for those of you that don't know us well. Okay, so NASMA is the North American Invasive Species Management Association, and our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. A little bit about what we do, education and advocacy, right here with National Invasive Species Awareness Week. We have a public facing uh, uh, outreach and awareness program with Play Clean Go. Uh, check that out at playcleango.org. Uh, we promote international standards such as our mapping standard and our certified weed free product standards for forage, gravel, and mulch. We also have professional development programs. We have a uh, invasive Species Manager Certificate Program. Uh, we offer monthly webinars and our annual conference. So save the date for the annual conference, September 27th through 30th in Missoula, Montana. And we will offer a hybrid model for those of you that are unable to travel to Montana this fall. Um, if you are not a NASMA member, I encourage you to please go to nasma.org and check out uh, our offerings, we have three individual membership options and four partnership opportunities. And my favorite membership benefit, although there are many, my favorite is our virtual networking events, which is held the first Friday of every month. The next one is March 5th at 10 a.m. All right, so again, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. And Oh, just, with that, I am going to um, introduce our first speaker uh, here for National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Uh, our first speaker today is Hillary Smith. She is the Senior Advisor for Invasive Species at the U.S. Department of the Interior. And Hillary is going to be presenting on the new uh, Department of the Interior's Strategic Plan for Invasive Species. So, Hillary, if you could please share your screen, you're welcome to take it away. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second day of National Invasive Species Awareness Week. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. The organizers did ask that I speak specifically on the recently released DOI Invasive Species Strategic Plan. So that will be the focus of my talk today. Do you wanna first start out uh, with an overview of the Department of the Interior? We have a very broad and diverse mission. So our mission is to conserve and manage the nation's natural resources and cultural heritage, to provide scientific and other information about natural resources and natural hazards, and to honor the nation's trust responsibilities or special commitments to American Indians, Alaska Natives, and affiliated island communities. And within Interior, we have a number of different agencies and offices, which we refer to as bureaus. And our bureaus have their own missions and authorities and roles when it comes to invasive species management. So within the Department of the Interior, our bureaus include the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Office of Insular Affairs, the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, 
the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. And across Interior, together with our partners, we're working on hundreds of different invasive species that include aquatic invasive species, terrestrial invasive species, and pathogens. Some of those are shown here uh, on this slide, examples of our high impact invasive species. And we're also contending with new arrivals of invasive species that have come more recently uh, in our history of working on invasives. Uh, the most recent of which, at least on this slide, is the Asian giant hornet uh, up in the, the uh, Washington state. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about this from our colleagues at USDA. So across Interior, we're grateful for congressional appropriations. Uh, last year, we had an estimated uh, $143 million that we invested to address invasive species. And this really goes to support uh, a lot of different base programs across their bureaus and offices, but it also helps to support uh, specific issues of interest. So for example, uh, last year, there was a big increase in work to address Asian carp. So again, today's focus is really on this recently released DOI Invasive Species Strategic Plan. And we're really excited about this uh, document, which is the first time that we've had a public facing a DOI wide invasive species strategic plan that really affects uh, all of the different bureaus and offices uh, across Interior. So they, this is uh, an example of some of the different topics that I'll cover with respect to the strategic plan. So the genesis for developing this plan uh, was in the John D. Dingle Jr. Conservation Management and Recreation Act. Some of you may be familiar with this law that was passed back in 2019. And this is a big law with lots of different um, topics that are covered and a component of that law pertained to invasive species. And one of the provisions, which is shown here on this slide, pertains to the development of a strategic plan. And the purpose of the plan, uh, was to achieve a substantive annual net reduction of invasive species populations or infested acreage on land or water managed by, in this case, the Secretary of the Interior. So the law required that we work in coordination with others. This includes states, tribes, and um, uh, counties, as well as uh, other federal agencies and stakeholders, including uh, governmental organizations and industry. Uh, we're also uh, directed to work with the priorities established by governors of states. And then lastly, we were directed to uh, take into consideration the economic and ecological costs of action or inaction. And I would note that this uh, John Dingle Act was amended in 2020 by the America's Conservation Enhancement Act. So I want to talk with you a little bit about the scope of the plan. Uh, we have extensive work underway, again, across our many different bureaus and offices on invasive species management. And we wanted the plan to reflect that ongoing work that's already in process. That being said, we also really wanted to ensure that the plan allowed flexibility to work on new and emerging issues and priorities as they arise. We're also really well aware that there are existing bureau plans on invasive species management at multiple scales. And also lots of different plans working with our partners and uh, interagency committees as well. So we wanted it, uh, we thought it was important that our DOI plan reflect uh, all of these other different plans and was complementary rather than duplicative. And we know that with invasive species management, it's absolutely essential that we work through partnerships. So you'll see in the plan, it's really a foundational uh, principle for us to be working in collaboration with others such as states, tribes, territories, local governments, other federal agencies, and, and uh, the full community of stakeholders that are working on these issues. So the plan does apply to the lands and waters that are managed by Interior, but we extended that scope of the plan to also include our responsibilities off of our lands. And it does reflect a full spectrum of strategies as well as a full spectrum of taxa when it comes to different invasive species and scales of implementation from national to local. When implementing the plan, it's important to recognize that this does assume our existing authorities and also the available resources that we have. And this is a five-year plan. So we look forward to revisiting it um, again in five years to see where uh, we might want to adapt it going forward. 
So when we developed the plan, uh, there are a couple different uh, steps that we took in terms of developing it. So we formed an interbureau work group. Again, this is a DOI-wide plan, so it was important for us to represent different bureau perspectives and interests. We also held a series of teleconference listening sessions in the fall of 2019. This was a really valuable opportunity from, for us to hear from you on what is important for Interior to take into consideration and what would benefit uh, you through our ability to work on invasives. So we had uh, eight sessions with states, counties, tribes, and other groups. This was again, really valuable to inform the development of the plan as we went into the winter uh, session. So again, through the winter and spring, we developed the plan with your input as well as with input from our bureaus. And then we presented the plan as a draft this last summer and we posted it in the federal register notice and we held another round of listening sessions and consultations with you to uh, see if we got it right. Essentially, uh, we, we heard what you wanted to have in the plan at the beginning of developing it, and we wanted to present it back to you and get additional input. And again, it was really uh, valuable uh, information that we, we received. I wanna thank you for your interest and your uh, public and your written comments on the plan. And then this, uh, last January, we got it out uh, in the public domain. So we're really excited to have the plan and I hope you had a chance to receive it and uh, take a look at it. So here's an outline of the plan. Um, again, we have a variety of information here that I hope will be of interest to you. There's strong introduction about the role of invasive species and our um, efforts to address them and some of the economic costs associated with invasive species uh, on our lands and waters. The plan lays out a vision and mission for the first time for Interior's work on invasives, and we also included a set of cross-cutting principles. So the goals, uh, objectives, and strategies are, of course, uh, the main uh, feature of the plan, and I'll talk about those uh, momentarily. I do want to let you know that um, there's a series of appendices here that I think uh, has additional information that you might find of interest. So one of the things that we heard during listening sessions was the importance of understanding the roles of the different bureaus and offices at, at Interior. So in Appendix A, you'll see a snapshot of the ways in which our bureaus are working on invasive species issues. Appendix B provides a map of the Department of the Interior Regions. And Appendix C provides examples of invasive species plans, agreements, and federal coordination. And again, during the outreach that we did on the plan, we heard from you that it was important to acknowledge some of the different ways that we work with our partners and promote coordination. Appendix D includes information on invasive species strategic plan metrics, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, momentarily. And lastly, Appendix E has laws and policies that guide our work at Interior. And again, so I hope this provides a good reference document for, for you on how in Interior is working on invasive species. So stepping back to the John Dingle Act for a moment, uh, you may recall one of those provisions uh, directed us to take into consideration the economic and ecological costs of action or inaction. And the plan does this in a number of ways that you see here on the screen, talking about the importance of cost-effective approaches uh, to meet our management objectives. And we also emphasize in the plan the importance of prevention and how that is the most cost-effective strategy that we can undertake to avoid long-term costs. So now I want to step you through the different goals and objectives that we have here. So we have five different goals. The first one focuses on collaboration, and there really is a lot packed into this goal. This one involves uh, focusing on the importance of partnerships. Right out of the gate, we wanted to emphasize that we must work together in order to be successful addressing invasives. So we focused on making sure we're an active partner in partnerships and where needed, step forward to lead uh, new partnerships. We also heard a lot from our stakeholders about the importance of information exchange. And this can happen both within Interior, across it, or many bureaus, but also with the public and our partners. Another objective is to promote the importance of educational campaigns. And we had great examples yesterday from NASMA of their work on the Play Clean Go campaign. We have Stop and Quit at Hikers, Clean Drain Dry, Don't Move Firewood, and others. So we want to make sure we're promoting uh, those educational efforts to change behavior. And then there's a set of objectives about funding and resources, uh, recognizing that we need to communicate what funding opportunities are available 
to you and also to leverage the limited resources we do have to advance our mutual priorities. The second goal is about prevention, and this includes preventing the introduction of invasive species into the United States and preventing the secondary spread uh, throughout the United States. So within this goal, we also emphasize the importance of research uh, to help develop new prevention methodologies. The third goal is about early detection and rapid response. And this goal really emphasizes the importance of coordination across inter uh, across jurisdictions so that we're working towards similar goals uh, for biosurveillance, identifying species of concern, and deploying the resources that we need to make sure we're doing those early detections as, as uh, efficiently and effectively as possible. And then importantly, following that up with uh, the pro appropriate preparedness for uh, and capacity for rapid response to eliminate these invasive species before they have a chance to spread. The fourth goal focuses on control and eradication. We know that there are lots of infestations that are well established. So this goal really focuses on uh, identifying those locations where we have a high chance of success for eradication or suppression to meet our, our natural resource objectives. There's also an emphasis on bridging the invasive species in wildland fire community to the extent that we can and to leverage research and innovation so that we have the control uh, techniques that we need to make sure that we can manage the invasive species. This goal also includes uh, working efficiently through the environmental compliance process. So again, that we can uh, be as effective as possible uh, and remove invasive species before they cause long-term damages. The last goal is focused on data management and the importance of using data to make informed decisions. So this goal focuses on uh, co data collection, uh, making sure it's accurate and consistent and available um, for ourselves as well as for the public. So this is helping to promote those interoperable databases. And again, making sure that we have decision tools using that data uh, to make in informed decisions about invasive species management going forward. And then lastly on the slide, there's a set of cross-cutting principles. And these really are the tenets of how we wanna do our work. Um, we wanna promote and engage in collaborative conservation. We wanna make sure we're making um, decisions based on science. And we wanna use an integrated pest management approach. So I wanna take a moment and talk about metrics. This was one area that we received a lot of public comment on. Um, we agree that invasive species performance measures are really critical to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to the work that we set forth in the plan and to do any course corrections that we need going forward with our programs. Uh, this also is a really tricky area of work. And so uh, we did put forward a set of 11 measures that will um, help to track our progress implementing the plan. Two of those measures are uh, existing measures on control, and then nine of them are new. So it will take us some time to work uh, with our bureaus to develop the appropriate data collection, um, evaluation, and reporting process uh, with those metrics. But I do want you to know that we're committed to working on this, not only with an interior, but also with our partners to make sure that we do have meaningful measures uh, when it comes to invasive species. I wanted to share with you um, the scope of the outreach that we did uh, for the plan. Again, this was a really critical aspect of developing the plan and we wanna thank you for your contributions along the way. We did hold those 2019 teleconference sessions um, across eight different uh, stakeholder groups and we had over 240 participants in those sessions that represented a great um, diversity of geographical areas. And then likewise, in 2020, we again had great participation across the country and upwards of 140 participants in those. So again, uh, your input directly informed uh, the content and the plan. So again, looking back to the John Dingle Act and some of the provisions that were included in the plan uh, about working with the priorities of governors. And as you know, priorities change from state to state when it comes to invasive species because the issues that we're faced with change. Uh, based on the location. And so what we heard from states was really, they wanted this plan to be flexible and not overly prescriptive. And so you'll see that also throughout the content of the plan. 
And you'll see throughout the plan the importance of collaborating with others to advance mutual priorities and working through existing networks to make those decisions. <clears throat> So I do want to acknowledge the variety of uh, participants from the bureaus who helped guide the development of the plan. Um, there were a number of bureaus who self-selected to be a part of the steering committee, but we did involve all of the bureaus through our DOI Invasive Species Task Force, which is a group that's uh, comprised of national program leads from all of the different bureaus and offices. And then we did extensive outreach within the interior bureaus as well for input. And again, I want to acknowledge all of your contributions and stakeholder engagement that we had throughout the process. So what does the implementation look like? Um, well, as I said, the plan really does reflect work that's already in motion across Interior. So the work that you're doing out um, on the lands and waters with Interior partners, that's the type of work that's included within the plan. But the plan also provides an opportunity to identify uh, emerging areas of work. So, for example, with the, the DOI Invasive Species Task Force that I mentioned, we're already working together on what we want to accomplish this year. Bureaus will be providing guidance on how to align their work with the new Invasive Species Strategic Plan. There are also interior regions where we're promoting interjurisdictional collaboration. And as, as I said, we'll be focusing on really fleshing out those performance measures and, and how to report regularly to the public. The DOI also has a broader strategic plan that covers all of the work under Interior, not just invasive. So we're working with the performance office that's working on that plan to ensure that there's coordination between our new invasive plan as well as the broader DOI plan. So when you talk about a plan, it can be a little more obscure and, and conceptual rather than what it looks like on the ground. So I did want to just take a moment and, and, and hopefully make that content come alive. What does this really mean? So it means working on horizon scanning and risk assessments to understand which species are likely to come to the United States or specific regions that we're concerned about, implementing provision, prevention measures, supporting the uh, National Park Service invasive plant management teams or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service invasive species strike teams, continuing to do research on detection and control, promoting the development of decision support tools so we know where uh, the most risky species are and the most likely locations where we want to focus our management or prevention, and again, supporting data management platforms like the USGS non-indigenous aquatic species, database or the biodiversity serving our nation database. And again, implementation looks like the boots on the ground, in the water, of working on invasive species of all sorts across the nation together with you. So in closing, I do want to just mention that um, the national there are many efforts um, across the federal family for interagency coordination. Again, that was something that we heard from you was really important for us to emphasize. And likewise, we agree, we, we need to be working together at all levels. And so uh, rest assured, there are a number of mechanisms in place at the federal level and at the national level, particularly what you're seeing here. And this is just an example of some of those mechanisms, but we are in communication with one another regularly um, about how we can be stronger together. Um, and again, we know that this type of coordination is happening across the country. So with that, I'll wrap up this presentation and I'll look forward to any questions during uh, the Q&A. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Hillary. That was great. I really appreciate that overview. <clears throat> I participated in some of those listening sessions and, and found them really valuable. So thank you. Okay, next up, we have our U.S. Department of Agriculture updates today. Uh, first, we will hear from Phil Andriazzi, Phil Andriazzi with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. He is our Invasive Species Coordinator. Uh, the second portion of this presentation is titled Highlights on the New USDA Forest Service-Led Publication, Invasive Species in Forests and Rangelands in the U.S., a Comprehensive Science Synthesis for the United States Forest Sector. And that portion of this presentation will be presented by Vanessa Lopez, Invasive Plants and Biological Control National Program Manager, uh, State and Private Forestry with the United States Forest Service.
And the final third portion of this presentation is titled USDA ARS Contributing Research on Invasive Species Control. That will be presented by Timothy Widmer, National Program Leader for Plant Health with the US Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service. I am absolutely thrilled to have the three of you here today. It's a pleasure to, to be part of uh, NISA this year, and thank you for inviting us to uh, give an agency update for USDA, um, which is a, a welcome challenge. And it's uh, welcome because we love being part of NISA and a challenge because USDA has an awful lot going on in invasive species. So um, an agency update means we have to be selective and talk about just a, a few things, which we're very happy to do. Um, USDA, just a little bit of background, is a large agency. Uh, we have over, uh, made up of 29 different agencies, or excuse me, a large department made up of over 29 agencies. Uh, we have close to 100,000 employees and we work all over the world and the United States in over 4,500 locations providing services to the American people for agricultural issues. Uh, the mission of USDA is to provide economic opportunity through innovation, helping rural America thrive, to promote agriculture production that nourish, better nourishes Americans while also helping feed others throughout the world, and to preserve our nation's natural resources through conservation, restored forests, improved watersheds, and healthy private working land. Um, as you can tell, an awful lot of the components of the USDA mission have um, a, an awful lot to do with invasive species. So for invasive species, USDA, and emphasizing in close cooperation with its partners, um, is committed to combating destructive invasive pests as an essential part of its mission to protect U.S. agricultural health. Invasive species is a very large part of what we do. Um, of those 29 USDA agencies I mentioned, at least nine of them directly and on a regular basis address invasive species issues um, internally to keep the, all those employees and all that expertise on the same page. We do internal coordination meetings between the agencies and myself and Samantha Simon, the senior invasive species coordinator for USDA, convene these meetings several times a year. Uh, we also have other uh, facilitate other ways in which different parts of USDA agencies can be communicating and sharing information updates of what's going on, sharing their resources and their expertise to other agencies who are facing similar invasive species issues. And of course, we coordinate with the rest of the federal government as well. Um, USDA is proud to be the co-chair of the National Invasive Species Council and myself and again, Samantha Simon, um, handle the um, non-political engagement with the National Invasive Species Council and their staff. Um, and USDA is an active member in numerous other collaborative invasive species organizations, task force, working groups. Um, again, invasive species is a very large component of what we do. And as I mentioned, it's uh, difficult to, to, to determine what exactly to talk about as an update for invasive species. So I've asked my colleagues in US Forest Service, Vanessa Lopez and Agricultural Resource Service, Tim Windmer to help discuss and give a, a snapshot or just an overview of some of the things that we're working on invasive species and that we're very proud of. So I'm going to ask uh, Vanessa to give a presentation and then Tim and then I'm going to hop back on and give a short presentation from USDA APHIS on a few updates as well. Thanks Bill and thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about a Forest Service led publication that's hot off the press. Um, it's titled Invasive Species in Forests and Rangelands of the United States, a Comprehensive Science Synthesis for the United States Forest Sector. So as you all are very aware, um, invasive species have a significant impact to uh, the ecology, economy, infrastructure, amongst other things across the United States and the world. And as worldwide trade continues um, to increase, we're getting an increasing amount of invasive species introductions and establishment um, here in the US and again around the world. This is a huge problem. Uh, so a few years ago, we decided there was a need for a sector-wide scientific assessment of the current state of invasive species science and research in the United States. So this book, Invasive Species and Forests and Rangelands of the United States, is just that. It's um, comprised of 16 chapters. There are eight regional summaries. And this book was written by over 100 experts 
experts from the Forest Service, other federal and state agencies, from universities, from NGOs, as well as industries. So this is a huge compilation of work with um, experts from a variety of different fields um, that focus on invasive species impact um, in a variety of areas. This book covers invasive species of all taxa, um, including insects and diseases, aquatic species, invasive plants, and vertebrates. Um, it's available on tree search, it's open access. And um, it's, it's, you know, just a really comprehensive piece of work. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the topics and um, you know, some highlights that we've identified in the book. All right, so some of the key topics that are um, discussed in this book are the impacts of invasive species on ecosystems. So we discussed changes in nutrient cycling, biodiversity, tree mortality, forest dynamics, fire regimes, hydrology, amongst other um, ecological impacts. Uh, we discussed the economic impacts of invasive species on um, industries like uh, ranching, forest products, energy, utilities, transportation. And we also discuss impacts um, on non-market sectors. And, you know, these are really hard to put a dollar value on. So impacts to recreation, to aesthetics, um, and as well as human health. And there's also a chapter that talks about um, impacts on indigenous cultures and their economies. Next slide, please. So, you know, we talk about the impacts, but then we also talk about management of invasive species. Um, and so that dives into EDRR efforts, you know, early intervention strategies. And we discuss the connections between risk assessment and prevention efforts. Um, we also talk about some of the management techniques and strategies, the types of controls that are used um, to manage these species across landscapes. Um, and we also talk about uh, restoration of these habitats and landscapes following invasive species introductions. Um, so some of these control methods that we go over are regulatory controls, cultural, physical, chemical, biocontrols. Um, we talk about vaccinations. Uh, these are mostly for vertebrate invasives, uh, host resistance, reproduction control, and using um, you know, IPM, a variety of these tools to manage and control these invasives. We also talk about um, some other tools and technologies that are used to quantify the spread and impact of invasives. And we, we discuss um, the importance of public engagement and outreach and education to help um, prevent the introduction and spread of invasives across the landscape. You know, a, a main conclusion that we have um, is that invasive species impact every region across the United States. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, we have eight regional summaries at the end of the 16 chapters. And so these regional summaries cover the significant invasive species across the various regions in the United States and their impacts. And so you know, the impacts are based on factors that include the geography of the region, the ecosystems, climate, the population, infrastructure. Um, and, and in every chapter, we um, include some key highlights. And also, we talk about some future needs and challenges. And in the book, um, some of these include uh, that we need to understand our improving um, we need to understand our uh, quantification of the ecological impacts of invasives. We need to develop better models of how climatic variability may impact invasive species spread. Um, we also need to focus on developing additional cost-effective tools to prevent and, re and control um, invasives across the landscape and also um, help to restore those landscapes that have been impacted by invasives. Um, and, and finally, we really need to broaden our understanding about the cultural, the social, and the economic impacts that these species have. Um, and again, that's really hard to define. It's hard to put a, a dollar value on these things, but I think this is an area that is um, gaining more attention, and, but still um, needs more attention to, to really um, understand the full uh, impact.
that these species could have. So um, those were just some of the highlights of the book. Again, it's titled Invasive Species in Forests and Rangelands of the United States. Um, it's free on open access. You can find it on Tree Search. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, if I can't answer your questions, I could um, forward your, your question to another one of our editors or um, another expert that we've worked with um, in the enormous amount of authors that we had um, contribute to this piece of work. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, with the, thanks for telling us about that fantastic accomplishment by the Forest Service. And with that, I'll ask Tim Widmer to start his ARS presentation. Allowing me the opportunity to present to you research activities of the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Um, as you probably know, uh, ARS uh, is the research agency for the US Department of Agriculture. And with uh, respect to uh, invasive species, we have uh, 10 locations that do research on invasive weeds and 18 locations that do research on invasive insects across the US. Uh, we also have five international locations, um, including a lab in France that is actually owned by the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, it is the only foreign um, lab owned by um, the USDA. And uh, I would also uh, like to now just quickly highlight some of the topics uh, that are being investigated uh, in ARS invasive species research. So um, biological control of invasive species is an important component of our research program. And uh, this research often begins at our international laboratories where these invasive pests are in their native habitat. And it allows us to have a year round uh, presence to find natural enemies that have the potential to be released uh, in the US without first uh, endangering uh, US agriculture. And as ARS conducts research on invasive species as a response to our stakeholders' needs because um, of restrictions on pesticide use, um, a sustainable solution for control, the economic benefits where a rate of return is estimated to be $23 for every $1 invested, um, and in land areas where there are very limited options. And some of these uh, invaded areas um, are inaccessible for more traditional control measures. And so uh, we're trying to investigate new technologies that um, maybe not real new, but are new to biocontrol, uh, such as you see in here, a drone here that's um, shown to be delivering uh, the biocontrol agents into inaccessible lands, uh, such as the Florida Everglades. In this example here, uh, giant Sylvania, uh, which is native to South America, has totally taken over this water habitat, as is shown on the left. And the ARS lab in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, worked extensively with our associated lab in Argentina uh, to search and discover this beetle uh, that was specific towards this weed. And then after only two or three years from the introduction of this beetle, the waterways cleared up and the ecosystem was returned to its natural habitat. I think you can really see the stark contrast. Next slide, please. Uh, another important area of research is to study the ecology of invasive pests and um, genetic characterization using uh, molecular biology allows us to identify new invasive species coupled with their center of origin. And this helps to identify effective biological control agents that will be a better adopted to similar climactic conditions and improves the success of released biological control agents. Uh, ecological studies also builds towards restoration with native plant communities. Understanding uh, plant traits that confer resilience to disturbances uh, and stressors and resistance to invasion uh, can guide reclamation towards rebuilding sustainable rangelands. And uh, these before and after photos show how we would like the system to operate. An example here is a pipeline uh, reclamation study where disturbed lands give invasive species the opportunity to inhabit the land sites. In order to restore these disturbed land sites back to native vegetation, it'll be ideal to sow with a plant seed mix that will confer resistance to invasive species, such as crested wheatgrass, uh, which competes with native species and has the potential to reduce grassland productivity. Using a functional base approach to determine which native plants have these traits, greenhouse and field trials are conducted on dissimulated pipelines. And I noticed there was a question um, in the chat about uh, replacing uh, pollinators. And that is uh, one characteristic that we try also to look into, uh, whether they are indeed compatible in these restoration projects. Finally, uh, ARS research uh, responds to immediate threats. 
Two very recent examples are the coffee leaf rust outbreak recently discovered last year in Hawaii, and the Asian uh, giant hornet, which also was first identified in the US last year. A coffee leaf rust is an example that I haven't spoke of um, before, and that is invasive plant pathogens. And we do plenty of research on invasive plant pathogens. In response to this discovery, ARS scientists are part of a task force in collaboration with USDA APHIS, Hawaii Department of Agriculture, university scientists, and industry. And ARS is taking a lead role in the development of screening of resistant cultivars. Another example um, is the Asian giant hornet, which gained a lot of media attention, um, a lot due to its name. Um, but it is a serious threat to bees, um, and you can see the relative size here and why it is of such great concern should it establish colonies in the U.S. Next, please. ARS was quick to contribute to releasing the complete genome of the Asian giant hornet. And you can see the timeline here where the specimens were first received on May 14th, and by June 29th, the assembly was finalized and then released to the public by August 6th. So why is it so important to complete this sequencing so quickly? Well, among many things, sequencing can lead to improved identifications, determining if any resistance might develop, and also help to develop any pheromone identifications for monitoring and trapping purposes. Next, please. And I'll just finish up by saying that this project is part of a larger project to sequence the top 100 U.S. agricultural arthropod pests and it shows the commitment of ARS to the I5K and Earth Biogenome projects. So this was a very quick and general overview of some of our research activities in ARS, and ARS research is very stakeholder driven, so we always welcome your input. I, I thank you for your attention, and I have put up uh, my contact information and that of uh, Steve Young, who has been recently hired by our ARS to be the National Program Leader for Invasive Pests. If you'd like further information, uh, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. And I'm going to talk briefly about USDA APHIS. Um, APHIS is the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Um, again, one of those nine agencies within USDA, along with Forest Service, ARS, and several other that works, um, has a lot to do with working on invasive species. Um, in fact, APHIS, case could be made, has uh, the most direct role working on invasive species. The APHIS mission is that APHIS protects the health of U.S. agriculture and natural resources against invasive pests and diseases. It regulates genetically engineered crops, administers the Animal Welfare Act, and helps people and wildlife coexist. Um, trade is also a major component in facilitating safe and effective trade is a big component of what APHIS does also certifies the health of U.S. agriculture exports and resolves phytosanitary and sanitary issues to open, expand, and maintain markets for U.S. plants and animal products. Um, APHIS is broken up into four major sub-agencies, you could say. Um, I think uh, plant protection and quarantine, veterinary services, wildlife services, and international services. And I think their titles give you a pretty good indication of what components of the APHIS mission they address. Um, so I'm going to go into just a few updates or highlights of uh, activities from APHIS PPQ, Plant Protection and Quarantine, this year, um, realizing there are many, many we could go into. Uh, the first is Ralstonia eradication. Uh, Ralstonia is an uh, invasive uh, pathogen uh, that was found in the United States early in 2020. Um, APHIS is very proud of the fact that they were able to eradicate Ralstonium solanaceum. Um, a particular uh, bio variant of that from U.S. greenhouses. Uh, this is a huge effort involving every part of plant protection quarantine uh, and partners in 44 states, more than 650 nurseries. In total, PPQ field staff and state officials destroyed more than 621,000 infected and exposed plants and stopped this pathogen. Um, uh, Ralstonia team has earned a lot of uh, kudos for both administratively and from our partners for this success um, and is very important in that this is allowed um, uh, safer um, uh, resumption of, of trade and had um, minimal trade uh, implications both for importing and uh, exporting due to APHIS's um, really successful efforts on this. 
Another virus that Aves has been working on is the tomato brown rugose fruit virus. Uh, this is a virus uh, that affects uh, can affect tomato and pepper production and has perhaps the most wonderfully unfortunate acronym of all, TOBARV. Um, it was imp found in, on imported tomato fruit in a plant in a university garden. Uh, the tomato and pepper production industry in the United States is worth some $2.3 billion annually. Uh, APHIS ordered two federal orders to restrict, to restrict imports of tomato and pepper seeds and transplants from all the countries in tomato pepper fruit from countries where the disease was known to exist. Um, the results of this uh, tremendous response is that Tobar is not established in commercial greenhouses in the United States, and that provides a strong assurances to uh, U.S. trading partners. And last couple slides are th two um, issues that have been much more in the news. Uh, you may remember last summer uh, that people were getting unsolicited packages of seeds in the mail from China. Um, as this happened, uh, PPQ swung into action and worked uh, with uh, State Departments of Agriculture around the country, uh, had been collecting and testing as many of the seeds as possible to determine whether the package pre presented any threat to U.S. agriculture or the environment. Um, as the U.S. PPQ offices collect the seeds, they are routed to the PPQ botanical identifiers. And as of uh, November 20th of last year, APHIS collected some 18,788 seed packages. And fortunately, we found that no evidence that of any intention to harm U.S. agriculture via these unsolicited seed packets. Uh, this summer, PPQ has uh, engaged in e-commerce agencies to update policies and processes and are confident, uh, expect that we, APHIS expects that the policy changes in e-commerce platforms will help to significantly reduce the volume of legal seeds and plants entering the United States moving forward. And lastly, as a species that uh, both uh, Hillary and Tim have mentioned already, the giant Asian hornet. Um, again, this is a species that was found in the Northwest corner of Washington State, um, first detected in December of 2019. Uh, Tim mentioned the impact this has to honeybees and other potential pollinators and hymenopterans. Um, in response to this detection, PPQ has been working uh, very closely with the Washington State Department of Agriculture, providing funding, technical expertise, and technology, um, and also has been working, as Tim mentioned, with ARS and academia to conduct the genetic research of Asian giant hornets captured in Washington, along with specimens collected at various locations in Asia. And as Tim mentioned, this will help to determine if there are multiple introductions of the hornet into North America and hopefully their points of origin and will allow us to more specifically tailor our response and technology development. So with that, I will thank everybody for listening and for their participation. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to thank Elizabeth and Bell and the rest of NASMA and the rest of the NISA team for um, enabling this uh, this week and under these uh, COVID situations, you're doing a great job and these uh, webinars have been really effective, I feel. Um, so thank you all for the opportunity and we look forward to taking your questions at the end. Okay, thank you so much to all three of you. That was outstanding. Next up is uh, updates from the Army Corps of Engineers. And we have two presenters. Uh, but first up, um, our next presentation is titled Development of Non-Structural Deterrence for Invasive Species Management. And this presentation will be given by Krista Woodley, uh, Team Lead for Bioacoustics with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Research and Development Center. Center. Um, I feel very thankful to be able to be here and talk to you all about um, some of the work that's going on for the Army Corps of Engineers related to invasive species, in particular the aquatic and the aquatic center. And uh, Dr. Crossland will be speaking later on some more of the terrestrial aspects. So a little bit about Urtic, which is where I'm located. Um, it's a little known laboratory. It's about 3,000 staff. And it's uh, basically the major research arm for the Army Corps of Engineers and as well as for the U.S. Army itself. So we have quite a few uh, core competencies, but one of them obviously is civil work since we primarily work for the Army Corps of Engineers. And invasive species as well as climate change 
is now on our portfolio of things that we can officially say. So we're, we're pretty happy to be moving forward in that realm. Um, in terms of deterrence, it, it's really a part of Ehrlich's effort to again support USACE and we've been developing aquatic species and invasive species technologies for almost two decades. Uh, to set the stage here, the Army Corps of Engineers has over 12 million acres of public lands and hundreds of water resource projects nationwide. And that's not including the property that we oversee globally in terms of nations where we currently or even temporarily reside. So invasive species are really an ever present problem for us. We wanna be uh, diligent nationwide as well as in the international realms that we're, we're participating in. And as we develop technologies, some of the things that Erdic is constantly challenged with, as well as the Corps of Engineers, and so we're working on this together with many of our partners, is it's not, it's one thing to develop a deterrent, but it's another to ensure it doesn't affect the environment, it has no effects on humans, human safety. In the case of aquatic deterrents, we're very keen on watching how it affects navigation. As you know, navigation is tied directly to U.S. economy, so if we delay or stall navigation, then we're actually hurting the economy. And, and that's not an intent as well. And then the cost of installation, uh, what it is, the initial cost as well as the O&M over time, and then the overall efficiency of the barriers as well. So as part of that, uh, that balance that we do between looking years out and trying to understand costs and benefits and, and where we may affect the United States, we balance that back against our studies and how we progress with our studies. And right now, I would say that the USGS and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service are our biggest partners in this effort. And we've had the ability to build a very strong team where we can move from laboratory to pond studies to these mesoscale field studies and out to large long-term deployments because we're leveraging all of the skill sets that are available from both of these other agencies. So um, we were asked on an NPR interview just the other day, why does it take so long to develop these non-structural deterrents? And I think one of the most important things to keep in mind as we move forward is these are, they're basically sensory deterrents, especially when we're talking about anything in the aquatic realm. So if we wanna have a very low environmental footprint, not affect navigation, we're relying on behavior in, in, of an animal. And as you and I know, you may be married, have partners, spouses, whatever the story, you know these people very well, and yet you can't always predict what they're going to do. And so with these non-structural deterrents, we're fighting the natural innate behavior and variation behavior, but there's all sorts of other stimuli and motivations out there. And so we actually try to engineer for those. And so when we're teaming up with Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS, we're trying to fit these scenarios into the USACE realm, but also engineering for other stimuli. And that creates a, a whole dynamic that's just a long process and very complicated. Ultimately though, when uh, Erdic has transferred out technology to a, a partner, we try to achieve what the Army considers a technology readiness level of number seven. And that's pretty important because that means we've gone through all of these analyses, we've done the, the cost comparisons, we've done um, field trials, long-term deployment trials to say, yes, this is ready to go out to the public, whether it is in industry or directly back to our district partners. So let's take a great case example, and it's underway. I'm sure a lot of you know of our Asian carp issue, and we've discussed it a few in the presentations prior to this. Uh, Brandon Road Lock and Dam is one of the big efforts within the USACE right now, and we've just entered the head phase, which is our engineering design phase. Um, this effort has been going on for quite some time and obviously is a priority to ensure that Asian carp, the movement forward from the Mississippi River to the Great Lakes is um, stopped, prevented, and worst case, at least drastically reduced. We're going for prevented though. Brandon Road Lock and Dam is on the Des Plaines River in Julia, Illinois. 
and it is under design alteration for several non-structural and structural measures to prevent the transfer of swimming, floating, and hitchhiking organisms. So if you look over on the right-hand side of the screen, um, the floating typically are eggs and larvae. Swimmers are considered active fish, and any hitchhiker could be an invertebrate or a um, any other type of plant or critter that could be stuck to these barges as they're moving through these locks and dams. And I like to think of Brandon Road Lock and Dam as a gauntlet of non-structural deterrence. Um, you're really working hard to get through that system the way we currently have it laid out. So let's take a look at some of the actual deterrents themselves and the philosophy as well as the research that's tied to it. And I'm not going to get heavy into the data. Um, other than to say, again, we've tested these out for quite some time with most of our partners. Um, the air bubble curtains are currently in use at many locks. Um, I don't think most people know that. We use them for ice control during the winter time. And so for the Army Corps of Engineers, at least, we really understand how to install them. We understand the O&M and how to maintain them, the problems we're going to have, they're low risk for affecting humans. Um, we have a lot of recreational vehicles that can easily glide over these without any issues. There's no human safety in terms, um, safety risks, sorry, in terms of if a human fell into water, what would be the cost of them being next to that deterrent? And there's minimal effects on navigation. One of the reasons um, this air bubble curtain has, has become really one of the favorite technologies is that it will actually deal with all three types of invaders that we foresee moving through Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So it will help to deal with the floaters and the hitchhikers by allowing these fish, um, or I'm sorry, the air bubbles to get in this entrapment zone. And basically there's a circular effect that happens here. And water just eddies through that system. And once it eddies in, the fish become retrained and it's very difficult to get them out of that space. So the air bubble curtain is quite efficient at moving those hitchhikers and floaters out. The other thing is from all of the laboratory studies, and we've um, done quite a bit now with the assistance of USGS as well as University of Minnesota, looking at the fact that the Asian carp will literally stack up in front of these air bubble curtains and not want to cross over. Some really, so some really effective research in um, up to 85% of the fish would actually deter and go around that air bubble curtain that you see over on the right hand side of your screen. So this is one of our, our new favorite uh, deterrents and mainly again it has a very small environmental footprint and we like that. An underwater acoustic deterrent, um, I'm actually sitting at Lock and Dam 19 right now in a rental home talking to you all. This is our current um, deployment that we're doing large scale. And the idea of the underwater currents is to use sound and pressure waves that are in um, influence the behavior. And uh, in some cases, if we chose to use them for this purpose, we could injure an aquatic organism. But by and large, in the case of Asian carp, we're looking for influencing the behavior. And part of the reason for doing this is we've been able to develop sounds that startle, frighten, or irritate the Asian carp. And because we can do that, we can vary the sound patterns, the loudness and frequencies, so that we can target the hearing range of Asian carp and not necessarily other native species using that, um, that part of Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So it will be very effective to deter the Asian carp in one direction, but allow native species to move through without having a large environmental footprint. Um, this effort also has associated with it underwater acoustic propagation models. And what we've been doing for that is developing a uh, long-term predict predictive capability for USA. So whenever the Army Corps of Engineers needs to consider putting a deterrent into a lock or perhaps Bureau of Reclamation or some of our other industries like TVA, we can show them how to run the software and actually how it will sonify the lock. So they understand immediately how many speakers they need in the placement of the speakers relative to the ambient sound and the flow moving through there. So this is a very large effort. And um, currently, as I mentioned, I'm here at Lock and Dam 19 with Mary Beth Bray, and she's representing the USGS side of the research. 
Another effort that I'm sure you've heard about in prior years is the electrical deterrence. They've been with the Army Corps of Engineers for quite some time. And we currently have three electrical barriers in the Chicago area waterway system. And we have a fourth that should be online later this year. And much like the air bubble curtain, um, because of the history we have with the electrical deterrence, we understand the cost of deployment to deploy them and maintain them. Um, the aquatic barriers utilize the same principle as impressed current cathodic protections, which is a scientific way of saying we pass an electrical current through the water, we create an electrical field. And as the fish approach the anodes, they um, experience an in increasing intensity. Now, typically the fish do not like this. It's uncomfortable and they'll, they'll buzz away. And if you were to do it on your skin, I do not recommend this, but if you were, it would be akin to um, uh, ultrasonic vibration before you get to a point that it actually immobilizes the muscle tissue and allows them to float down river. Um, this deterrent we do understand quite well, but we also have some issues and um, navigation is quite concerned about the human safety factor uh, as they move vessels through the electrical deterrent system at Brandon Road Lock and Dam. So we're spending much of our pen, PED funding in efforts currently to make that system a much more human friendly system uh, because we do understand how, it, how effective it is for invasive species. Um, one of the other systems that we're putting in at Brandon Road Lock and Dam is the flushing lock. Uh, there are no prototypes of the system. We haven't actually been able to test it with biology. We've done quite a bit of research in the laboratory as you can see over on the left hand side of your screen. The idea of the flushing lock is, is fairly simple. Um, we move a barge into the area and rather than bringing the pool height up right away to allow the barge to pass upstream, we will actually flush a fair amount of water onto the bottom of the barge and the size of the barge and have it flush out of the lock. And by doing that, we can actually address any floaters that may be stuck um, to the outside of the barge and try to get it back downstream and not allow it to flow past Brandon Road Lock and Dam. Um, again, this type of deterrent in terms of O&M, we understand quite well because we already have valves that do this. We're just gonna make them a little bit more um, focal and how they run within the lock itself. And uh, there's no additional risks to humans and human safety. So this is one of the newer te technologies that we have that we're bringing online that we're very excited about. The last deterrent that I'll um, kind of approach today relative to Brandon Road Lock and Dam is the carbon dioxide deterrent. And this one actually didn't make it onto the proposed Brandon Road Lock and Dam list, mainly because it was still in development and hadn't been prototyped yet for us to be able to understand the costs before we began to do negotiations with the states as well as with um, the chief and headquarters. You, you need a fair amount of confidence to make uh, a report that a chief will sign. So the carbon dioxide deterrent was left out. However, since this has gone through, we've done prototype developments at Kakuna Lock and at the Chicago area waterways, and uh, it will become a backup deterrent basically for the electrical barrier. This work we're doing in coordination with USGS, of course, and Aaron Cuff is in charge of that side of the coordination effort. Um, some of the other places we're looking to put the CO2 barrier is on the Tennessee River at some of the locks they have over there. And we're developing CFD models that will actually inform the system operations, permits, regulatory reviews, water quality, how we're, how we're affecting water quality and when the CO2 actually is blown out of the river so that the water quality isn't carried downstream. One of the reasons we like the CO2 deterrent is really because it's the only chemosensory deterrent that we have. So it makes a really nice deterrent if we're working in a place that isn't necessarily a lock and we need to address all sorts of um, uh, non-predictive influences that are, would not be presented within a lock chamber itself. So um, with that, I just wanted to, you know, thank you for your time and for allowing me to talk a little bit about what we've been developing for USACE and, and, and um, invasive species themselves. And uh, we just look forward to engaging with you more often about this subject.
Thank you so much, Krista. That was outstanding. I really do appreciate that update. And uh, for folks that want to learn more about Asian carp, tune in, tune in tomorrow. We have one more presentation today um, on the Army Corps updates, uh, including implementation of the 2020 Water Resources Development Act. We're having a little bit of tech trouble, so uh, we, we do have Jeremy Crossland with us, um, but uh, no slides today. It's just not working, so that's okay. We're so grateful to have Jeremy here um, to share some updates with us. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Crossland, Program Manager for Land Use and Natural Resources with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Welcome, Jeremy. Yes, I apologize. Uh, my slides are somewhere between our server in Washington, D.C., where I'm at in Florida. And um, yeah, I don't know. But I got a blank screen finally about three minutes ago that said, please enter first slide when I tried to reopen it. Long story, but I apologize. Um, it's, again, Jeremy Crossland, and I work at headquarters uh, USACE. So I was going to run through with some background, um, uh, what's going on at the core? And I think um, outside of some really cool technology that Krista just talked about and many other things that are in development, what most people uh, want to understand is what the new WERDA means and um, what that means for some of our operational programs and research. So uh, I will say that first off, we're still sorting through that. Um, you know, there was a lot of provisions, as there always are, some better written than others. Um, and so I think some of the take homes, I had to make some bullets here, but, you know, we added, or we, it, it, it's clear that we should focus on the international border between us and Canada for the inspection station program. And um, how we're going to do that, I don't know yet. And we will be, um, We'll be thinking about that and working with our state partners to figure out the best plan for that. And I'm going to say that a couple times in the next few minutes. So it's not that we're not ready for it. We're just, it just, it's sort of still hot off the press. Um, so border protection, more to come. Um, I think it's a great idea and uh, we're going to figure out how we can work with the states and provinces to figure out how that works. Um, Russian River Basin in California was added. Man, that was a lot simpler than trying to figure out where the Arizona River Basin was, to be honest with you. So um, we should be able to come up with a plan and figure out how to add the Russian River to the inspection station program with not very much work. I mean, it's a process, but it's a simple one when we know where the basin is. And interestingly enough, we did find the Arizona River, and as we all suspected, it's in Arkansas and Oklahoma and should have been called the Arkansas River. So now that that has been cleared up, uh, we will start, we've been coordinating with the states and we've had some interest from some, but we will still start an effort to coordinate with all the states that are potential cost share partners in inspection stations and monitoring and get a game plan together to um, do a letter report and go through the same process we did in the Columbia and elsewhere. So I think, Another, so um, there was clarification to make it inspection and decontamination stations, which I think is semantics. That's really how we were approaching things with our state partners. No one was being prevented. I'm not saying it was bad to add it. It just, I think that uh, is a simple, um, that's how we do business kind of thing. Um, you know, there was changes to um, it put the funding, it, it increased the ceiling to the program which is a ceiling of authorization, right? It doesn't mean that there's that much money out there. Um, but, and then it put funding into buckets in authorizations, which I don't know that helps or hurts us. It's there um, and it's so, I don't know. I don't, I, I just, it's present. I don't know what to say about it. Um, I understand some people's intent with it, not critical or positive towards it. It just, it's there. And if we get to that issue, we'll address it when we get there. But the funding levels versus what was, written in, I don't think would impact anything anytime soon. Um, so that's authorization, that's what changed. And then we got a budget about the same time. And, you know, the program, the aquatic plant control program, which 
the aquatic plant control is the program where the inspection station program is housed or lives um and i had about three or four slides to show the history of how that works but at the end of the day the program is called aquatic plant control program and through warda and the rivers and harbors act since 1958 it's been amended to take in all aquatic invasive species and then not just focus on control but to focus on prevention through inspection stations and i'm happy to answer questions now or any other time about that history and how it worked but um i won't bore you with it without slides because it would have been a lot more interesting so um yeah the program this year the budget's 25 million six of which will go towards the research and then um there's inspection stations monitoring um and uh targeting flowering rush and hydrilla um so i mean it's broken out and it's pretty simple i think straightforward in how we will fund and execute the program um and then outside of the aquatic plant control program again without slides not near as interesting but many people are familiar with our invasive species leadership team within the corps of engineers uh and i would say our priorities last year and this year are uh pretty cool stuff we're trying to wrap up an effort to figure out what emerald ash borer has cost us as it moves across the country it's terrifying honestly um and we, i hope we'll have some papers out showing how we went through the process to sort of measure not sort of to measure that or estimate it and what we think left out there um it's dumbfounding the impact it's had on our projects i mean it's easy to understand what it's done to em or to ash but i guess when you put it at your project and in your backyard it was it's it was it's pretty impressive but it's going to be a lot of money and a lot of lost man hours and obviously a lot of lost trees so i look forward to hopefully being able to share some papers that we have uh put together on that some maybe one journal worthy and others will just be technical notes or white papers information that we'll share um and then we're working across department of defense to to come up with a gis standard for invasive species data collection we have our own uh data standards for gis stuff in all natural resource realms within department of defense and we're working with uh um and we're working with the other uh parts of the armed forces to come up with a single standard and a single set of attributes so that we can all speak the same language and report the exact same thing or as close as we can to the exact same thing across the uh across department of defense um so it, i think to me that's one of the coolest things we're doing right now because gis data is what we live and die by but honestly and i don't i'd be interested to hear how it works elsewhere but we can't share gis data from uh project to project sometimes because they've all created their own attribute table i'm not saying that anybody isn't doing their best to to help out and record good data but just coming up with a standard will really move us uh to a different level of data sharing internally and externally um and then we went through a good or a pretty fun and interesting process to look at how our hydropower projects are being impacted by invasive species and what we see is the future of impacts and again we're putting together sort of a technical paper but not journal paper to uh illustrate what we figured out from a year's worth of poking and prodding around our plants and our operators to figure out what's really going on from quagga zebra mussels to water hyacinths to erosion from losing silver maples it's a it's a strange combination of things but uh at the end of the day it's it's costing us money in the terms of operation man hours and uh power outage or uh, lost power supply opportunities i'm not a hydropower engineer but i say it wrong and they get offensive not power outage but anyway um bearing my complete lack of slides i think i will leave it at that thank you so much um okay we are going to jump to q a now so if i could have the speakers come back uh, with your video if you're able um and then i do have some questions hopefully we can get through the majority of them today and i did have a few submitted ahead of time so okay thank you all so much all right so this uh first question was submitted um before the event and um it's, it's a little bit more specific to u.s forest service um 
but the, the statement says, the majority of funds for noxious weed control comes from the Hudson Vanderberg Act, funds generated through timber harvest activities. While these funds are important, they are restricted and fluctuate and present challenges for land managers conducting treatments. Are there any other funds dedicated to invasive species control? And specifically, is there any progress in creating a line item for invasive weed control in the U.S. Forest Service? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> I think I should probably cover it because I manage the invasive plants program and um, we do have a line item in our forest health protection budget specifically for invasive plants um, and last year it was about two million dollars which is you know not that much when you consider the enormous problem um, but for forest health protection we've been contributing about that um, and, and this year it'll be the same. So, you know, there are resources that are dedicated for invasive plants um, in state and private forestry and other um, deputy areas within the Forest Service. We have a couple of questions about biological control. Um, and I just wanna plug our biological control committee here at NASMA. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in biocontrol or you work in biocontrol and you're not involved in our committee, I, I highly recommend getting involved um, in, in the NASMA biocontrol committee. But nevertheless, um, the, the question is, and maybe it's more of a statement, uh, research is needed for fig buttercup, lesser calendine pathogen biocontrol, um, could USDA do research in European labs, fig buttercup? Uh, as far as we know, this is unfunded right now. Uh, this is both an aquatic and terrestrial problem. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so that is uh, you know, a potential target. We're always looking for new targets. Um, it is not one of our current ones now. Um, our lab in France would be an ideal location for that because uh, it is native to that area. Um, and so um, we can do, you know, quick searches. Th this problem is, of course, with almost all federal agencies is um, under resourced uh, and also understaffed. Uh, and so when we're developing new projects, we need to look for those collaborations and such. But we're open to those kind of uh, talks and um, the sooner the better and the sooner to start getting those planned and, and start thinking about them. So if there is, you know, interest, um, then, you know, those are the kind of discussions that, that we will need to have, you know, at some point. Uh, how do we, you know, get the resources um, to, you know, have our staff either increased or, you know, switch? Because if we go to one project, we're going to have to get rid of another project. Yes. Okay, and, and I think the same question on Japanese stilt grass and a, a a biocontrol insect that did not recently pass the process, and can can that be reconsidered? I'm I'm not familiar with the um, with the tag proposal, uh, you know, for that, so I can't comment on that. However, um, Japanese stillgrass, um, one of our uh, stateside labs um, in Fort Detrick, Maryland, was looking at endemic pathogens for Japanese stillgrass, and I believe that that is still a an ongoing project um, with them. So um, there is still um, interest, at least on the pathogen side. Again, I'm sorry, I, I cannot comment on the, on the insect because I'm just not aware of it. Great, thank you so much. Okay, moving along, what can the Department of Interior and the USDA do to prevent invasive plants and animals from coming into the country? Maybe the question is, what are you already doing and what more could you do? <laughs> Maybe I'll quickly touch um, on interior because I think our scope is much narrower than USDA, but our prevention authority really lies within the US Fish and Wildlife Service and their ability to uh, regulate the importation of injurious wildlife species. And that injurious wildlife designation is a specific process that the service undertakes to identify these first um, particular species. So um, I know Gary Lovett had some questions about this in the chat and I provided some content there. So um, take a look. There's some more additional resources and links available and uh, subject matter experts on injurious wildlife list listing if people want more information. But I think largely the prevention authority lies with 
um, USDA still turn it over to Phil and, and his team. Thanks, Hillary. Um, yes, it's um, USDA APHIS is a major component of what we do is um, to prevent the importation and introduction of invasive species uh, along those lines, working both in pre-clearance efforts to inspect and certify goods before they leave offshore is coming to the United States. And also at the ports of entry, we work hand in hand with the Department of Homeland Security for inspection of goods coming into the country um, and doing the necessary testing and, and secondary inspections that whatever the, the, the um, uh, customs, the, the DHS employees find. Um, so yes, it's a major component of, of what APHIS does. Thank you. Okay, just a comment that um, related to Jeremy's presentation that the Army Corps of Engineers is currently taking comments on the Upper Missouri EA through March 2nd. So just so folks are aware of that. Um, and then a follow-up uh, question for Jeremy again. Uh, if Congress appropriates 50 million for the Army Corps of Engineers to partner with states and other agencies for Russian olive and salt cedar control in Western US basins as authorized in 2020 WERDA, um, is, that, is that an achievable goal for the Army Corps of Engineers? Achievable? Yes, I think so. But um, I think that uh, the simplest thing I can say is so through WERDA, That'll go out for public comment. Um, it, any, there's a couple other pilot programs in there I should have mentioned, but all that will go through public comments. So we'll get an idea of what people intended other than the four sentences that's in WERDA. And don't mean it sarcastically, but it's a pretty short uh, description. And then we will write our own from what we get in public comment and what we understand from other conversations and the language, we would write implementation guidance that would say this is how the core plans to implement this and then assuming funding comes in that manner we'll have a we'll have marching orders to implement in a manner that we intend that we believe meets everybody's merit and what they intended for us to do and i i guess i can't say number one there's no money there which is uh but number two i can't say that's inachievable or too complicated um we will work through a process to make sure we can do it if when the time comes Thank you. And I guess that's a similar answer to another question about authorization for, for Asian carp prevention. Um, well, we are just out of time. And so um, I want everyone to just, wherever you are at home, at work, uh, just give a virtual round of applause to these amazing speakers today. Um, we so appreciate each and every one of you and the hard work you're doing and all of the work that you represented today in your respective agencies across this country. So many people working so hard on invasive species. So thank you so much for being with us to share your updates. Um, again, we sincerely appreciate it. I'm just gonna really quickly, before we conclude, share my screen and let everybody know what we have going on the rest of the week for the remainder um, of our NISA uh, events here. So again, thank you so very much to our speakers. Um, and if we did not get to your question, I will do my best to circle back with you after the event. So I will download those chat logs, okay? So tomorrow's webinar, same time, uh, register at nisa.org. It is our Aquatic Nuisance Species Priorities for Prevention and Management session. Uh, you will hear from Susan Pasco, the Executive Secretary of the ANS Task Force on the new ANS Strategic Plan for the Task Force and tremendous amount of work being done by the committees. Um, yours truly will be sharing on behalf of the Western Regional Panel on ANS, the updated recommendations for the Quad Quagga Zebra Action Plan. Uh, you'll hear from Nate Owens about the reality of managing a quagga mussel infested site at Lake Powell, along with partners uh, from the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. Uh, then we'll switch gears to Asian carp and we'll learn about the National Asian Carp Management Plan from Amy McGovern with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we'll conclude with Brian Shonug from the state of Indiana, who's the Asian Carp Specialist and also Chair of MICRA um, on the 
importance of creating sustainable large river fisheries. So please join us tomorrow. It's a great lineup. We hope you will be here. Um, Thursday and Friday, again, outstanding speakers. Thursday is our science policy and solutions for invasive species. Um, and so we have great stuff for you on Thursday. Trisha will be speaking on invasive species councils um, with the Morton Arboretum and the state of Illinois. Uh, Brendan Kirian from Cornell will talk about carbon sequestration and Gary Lovett with the Cary uh, Institute of Ecosystem Studies will be talking about the Tree Smart program. And then Friday, we'll wrap it up with Lee Van Wyken and we'll talk about those authorizations and those appropriations and how we can best work together to get funding for invasive species to the ground. And of course, all of our webinars are being recorded and will be available on NASMA's public YouTube channel just as soon as we can process it. There's lots of ways for you to get involved with NISA this week. Um, and I encourage everyone to join NASMA. And if you have the ability, participate on our legislative committee and help us plan the next NISA event. So with that, I thank each and every one of you for attending. We appreciate you and we're so grateful for you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you tomorrow.